deserve a champion? What does it take to really truly be a champion? When you are in that position and competition shows up, be ready to fight. Be ready to fight. Be ready to fight for your life. Be ready to give it everything you got. Make sure what you are up against understands that you are there to do business. Make sure everything that you believe in stays with you. If you believe that you are a champion, then stand on it. Because that is ultimately what champions are made for. Be ready to fight. I mean, who's ready to fight, right? I mean, that's, does that not get you fired up? Yay. We're ready to fight. We're, guys, it's great to be with you this morning. We're here to fight because we want the heart of a champion. You know, Pastor Tim, he started us off last week. He kicked this whole series off where he started talking about how, you know, our hearts are called to be pure. And wherever you're joining us today, whether you're, you know, here in, at, at Goshen or out at Drive-In Church or you're watching online or you're in Mishawaka or you're in St. Pete, I love you, St. Pete, wherever you are, we are here today because we want the hearts of champions. We don't want to be mediocre. We don't want to be second best. We don't want to look back after we've lived our lives and be like, man, I wish I could have done that better. We are here today because we want to fight for what God has laid before us. Because he has, right? You have a purpose. You have hope. You live your life fighting like you do. That's what we're talking about throughout this whole series. Last week, it's true, Pastor Tim, he talked about how our hearts are called to be pure, right? And we're talking about David. You know, when he was telling the story about David, right? How Samuel came, the high priest of all of Israel. He was looking for the next king because God said, guess what? There's going to be a new king. And he's like, okay, God, direct me where I'm supposed to go. And where'd he go? He went to a dude named Jesse who had a bunch of sons, and he was looking for the next king. And he looked at everybody, and he's like, is this it? And Jesse's like, actually, no, I got, I got another son. He's out. He's the, he's the young pup. He's out in the fields watching the sheep. He's like, well, bring him in. And what we learn about David, we learned that man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And if you realize something about David, you realize that his name and the word heart is often said together several times. In fact, Scripture says that David is the man after God's own heart. I mean, whoo, talk about being loyal. I mean, wouldn't it be great at the end of your life if, there, if God was like, you were, the, you were the one after my own heart? I mean, that's like, well done, good and faithful servant. I mean, we could all be like, yeah, thank you, thank you. My mom would be so proud. You know, like... Our hope is that our hearts would be so open to God that he would turn us into these mighty champions. That our hearts would be so solidly in sync with the heart of God that not only our life but the lives of other people around us would be changed. And we saw that last week with David, that the heart is important. And Pastor Tim zeroed in on a verse and he said this. This was a phrase and you'll probably hear it throughout this series. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. And the, verse, the, the passage, the verse that we pull that from is Proverbs 4.23. It says, guard your heart above all else. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Your heart determines the course of your life. And, you know, we do, we see this in David. I mean, we watch this play out. And today, last week, we talked about how, you know, the, the heart of a champion is pure. This week, we're going to see that the heart of a champion is courageous. The heart of a champion is courageous. And we see this like play out. I'm going to set a little scene for you here, right? Like David, so it's been a little while, right? Since like he was anointed to be like the next king, right? And you know, like just because that happened, like there's a long time between when he becomes king and that moment. And like, so you've got this moment, right? Because he's got all those brothers. The Israelites are fighting these people called the Philistines. The Philistines are these people who are basically, they're conquering warriors. They're just dominating everybody. And if you can imagine, right, like you're watching like the Lord of the Rings or something like that. On one hill, you've got, you know, all the Israelites. And on the other hill, you've got all the Philistines. And there's this dude, right? And you probably, or maybe you've heard of him before. He's a nine foot tall dude. Anybody in here want to be nine foot tall? Anybody? at home want to be nine foot tall? I always wanted to be nine foot tall. I don't know why. I wanted to be huge. Like, I'm a big guy, but I wanted to be bigger. This is the thing. Goliath was his name. He's nine feet tall. He's sitting out there in the middle of the field, and he's just shouting at the Israelites all day long, hey, come out and fight me. One-on-one, -on -one, winner take all. 
all day, all day, all day. Now, if you're the Israelites, if I was the Israelites, I'd be up on the hill like, like, I'm not going out there. Look at that dude. He's out in the middle of a field towering over everything. He's the only person willing to stand out there. All of us are all up on our hills. I mean, I don't know about you, but like, that would make me a little bit nervous. And like we see this story, right? It's been set because Saul the king, he's over there with his people, the people of Israel, right? God's chosen people. And David's coming around, you know, and he's just like, I'm here to bring my brothers lunch because I'm not old enough to fight in a battle, but I'm going to bring them lunch because they need the sustenance because they're about ready to go out and they're about to do some business. And so what happens? He shows up. He sees Goliath out there in the middle of the field and he's like, what is going on? What is going on? Now, I don't know about you, but I feel like I've probably been the Israelites a lot in my life. I mean, I can't help but think and I can't help but ask you the question, have you ever been scared? Have you ever been scared? I mean, maybe it's not like fear, maybe it's worry, maybe it's doubt, maybe it's a little anxiety, but like you've got this emotion where you feel uneasy about stuff and you're like, I don't know, I don't know that I can handle it. I have felt scared many a times in my life. In fact, I'm gonna be a little bit vulnerable with you. I'm gonna put something out there. It's kind of trivial, don't make fun of me, but I do not love roller coasters. I don't love roller coasters. You're like, Remington, you don't love roller coasters? You seem like you'd have a lot of fun. You like to have fun. You're kind of a little bit crazy. Yeah, no, not this guy. It wrecks me up. I mean, even from a young age, not just roller coasters, amusement park rides wasn't my thing. Five years old, the year was 1988. It was a great year, I think. I was five, so I assume it was a great year. But like Walt Disney World, here I am, the haunted mansion at Disney World with my parents. Go through the lobby, get freaked out, get out, see that there's these black cars going into darkness. Boom, fast as I can, right out the side door. My parents couldn't even keep up with me. Rode the old Thunder Mountain Railroad, which is like the most ridiculously easy roller coaster in the world to go on. And this one lady standing next to my mom as we fly by and she says, oh, look at that poor boy. He's just so sad. Yeah, that's my son. <laughs> I mean, the shame, right? I mean, because that's what we do, right? When we have fear, like we then let other emotions get into play. Like we begin to have doubts. We begin to have shame. We begin to adjust and alter how we operate. I, can, I can't tell you how many times I've been to, you know, on a field trip to an amusement park where I've like had to alter. Like, I've spent a lot of times in the arcades at big amusement parks because I did not like roller coasters. Now, I've been on a lot of roller coasters now in my life. I've kind of gotten over it. But it's still like, it's, I mean, like, you don't get it. Like, your mind starts to run. Your heart starts to pound. There's a chemical reaction in your stomach. All of a sudden, feels like it's about to just drop right out. And you're like, am I going to make it through this line? Am I going to make it through the line? I'm going to die before I get on this roller coaster. Nobody else has had that feeling? Maybe it's just me. But I mean, like, it's not just like trivial things, right? Because there's things in life where that happens to us all the time, and that is pretty trivial. A roller coaster is pretty trivial. You're like, Remington, you're scared of that? Yeah, but like, what about that diagnosis that you get and you're just not sure what you're going to do with it? What about your job? And like things just don't seem to be lining up for you. Or maybe you need a raise because you just can't make ends meet, but you love where you work, but you're not quite sure if they got the money and you don't know how you're going to ask them about it. What about that broken relationship that you have because maybe you or maybe somebody else are making destructive decisions? Like, and then you worry about it and you get scared because you don't want to sacrifice what you have, right? Because what you have is good enough. You just, not, you just know that it's not what's right. It's not what God has for your life. I mean, we all struggle with fear. We all struggle with doubt, worry, anxiety. And what I need you to realize today is that the heart of a champion is courageous. The heart of a champion is courageous. And I mean, we see this play out, right? Because David, I mean, the audacity of this little boy who shows up, right? This young man who shows up in the midst of all this chaos that's about to happen. And he says, hey, what is going on? And he says it, he says it so matter of fact, like he walks up to the king. This boy walks up to the king and says, don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. <laughs> Can you imagine approaching your life with that much audacity? Being the smallest thing in the room and walking up and saying, I got this. And this is where we see the challenge, right? The challenge that's placed before us, and it's a challenge that we get at every area of our life. And the challenge is this. A courageous heart will always fight for what's right. 
They will always fight for what's right. You have a choice right now in your life today. You could choose to let something that you fear, that you worry about, that gives you anxiety, run your life. Or you could choose to fight for what's right. A life that God says is a life to the fullest. That's your choice every day. The goal is by the end of today, you will know which way you're going to go. And I hope it's one way. A courageous heart will always fight for what's right. And you see this, right? You see it play out. You see it play out in this story. And I love this story. It's one of my favorite stories because it does. Like, it makes me realize, like, I can do this. And Saul, Saul says this. I mean, and maybe we hear this a lot in our head, right? Because we've probably said this to ourselves. Like, I got this. And then, like, all the doubt starts to roll in. Everything starts to creep in. And you're like, I can't do this. But not Saul. I mean, Saul's that voice right here. He says, don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you could fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy. And he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. (laughs) Good resume, right? And he says, when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If an animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and I club it to death. I've done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from the Philistine. Saul finally consented. I mean, what are you going to say to that? All right, go ahead, he said. And may the Lord be with you. I mean, look at that. The confidence. What does he say? Like, what does he say? What does he reference? Like he says, I got this. I watch sheep. And you're like, seriously? And then like you hear him talk and he's like, I've clubbed lions. I've killed bears. I've done this. Why? Because God has been with me. He's brought me to this point and he'll take me further. I believe it. And see, what you realize is that the heart of a champion is one that that has confidence. You realize in the story, when you read it, you can have confidence because a, a courageous heart overcomes fear. Was David scared? I'm sure he was. I'm sure he was like, I mean, I fought bears and lions. I mean, God's taking care of me. I was pretty scared then. But that doesn't mean he probably wasn't scared now. But he was going to fight for what was right. Ain't nobody going to talk to the Israelites. I just said ain't. I'm not sure why. Nobody's going to talk to the Israelites saying, hey, you can't do this because the God of all creation is our God. And he's not going to stand for it. A courageous heart overcomes fear. You know, what I think we do, we spend a lot of time gaming gaming things out in our head. Like, we forget that. We don't think we can overcome it, but we like to play out the scenario. I mean, have you ever been in a situation where you have to have a crucial conversation with somebody? You ever have to have a crucial conversation that you don't want to have, but you know you need to have it, or you're not going to have resolution with a conflict? I mean, how do you do it? Like, this is what I do. I'm going to say this, and then they're going to say this, and then I'm going to say this, and then they're going to say this, and I'm going to say this, and then they're going to say this, I'm going to have both this, and they're going to be like, oh, yeah. And I'm like, see, told you so. How many times have you done that? What, are we crazy? Like, seriously. We build this fantasy where we, like, resolve it, and really it doesn't do anything to resolve it. In fact, it does one of two things. It's a coping mechanism where we basically self-talk ourselves forever, never really resolving the actual issue, but we just kind of, you know, satiate the angst that we have about it. Or we work ourselves up into a frenzy until we just blow up on somebody. Either way, they don't end really well, and they come from a lack of confidence. Because we don't believe, right, that if I'm doing the right thing and that God is with me and I'm just and I'm righteous and I'm being holy about this crucial conversation that I need to have, then God is going to handle it and it's going to be okay. I mean, talk about a lack of confidence when you try and navigate and control and manage your life to avoid maybe uncomfortability, maybe what you feel is like insecurity, No real resolution. I mean, you know what it does? It robs you of your joy. Because what happens is, is you take your eyes off God. And you forget that he overcomes everything. Because he has overcome everything. And instead, you let your mind and your heart fixate on whatever this anxiety or fear or worry or doubt is. And it robs you of your joy. 
I mean, you look at David, right? He writes so much, the Psalms, like he's writing all of these things where he's like talking about God, you know, and like you hear his whole story about these different moments where he like triumphs and has joy, and it's because he kept his eyes on God. He was a man after God's own heart. Are you worried about that thing in your life? so much to where you've let it consume you? Are you keeping your eyes on God, remembering that the confidence that comes with the heart of a champion, a courageous heart overcomes fear? And I mean, the story, right? It goes on, right? And I mean, this is where it starts to get juicy. All right? Then Saul gave David his own armor. It was a bronze helmet and a coat of mail, chain mail that he wore. And David put it on. He strapped the sword over it and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such a thing before. I can't go in this, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them in his shepherd's bag. Then, armed only with his shepherd's staff and his sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him. I mean, this dude is a professional warrior. He's got somebody who carries his shield. Sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy, what, am I a dog? He roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the name of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. I mean, at this point, I would be sweating, mostly because I sweat all the time, but I would be sweating if I was David. And so David replied, what does he do? David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head, and then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with the sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. I mean, have you ever approached anything in your life with that much audacity? A giant out in the middle of of the field is yelling at a boy, and he's saying, hey, I'm going to feed you to the birds and the animals. And what does this boy do? Oh, yeah? Well, get this. God's going to deliver me and all your friends, and I'm going to feed all y'all to those birds and animals. I'm going to take off your head, and everybody's going to watch me do it, and they're going to know what's happened here today. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm sure there's been a couple of times where maybe I've had that kind of audacity in life, but I don't know. I mean, it might not be that bold, and I'm a pretty bold person. But here you've got this boy with this holy boldness. I mean, talk about courage. I mean, and I'm sure there were, there were moments in David's life where he had doubt. I'm sure there were moments where he was fighting a lion or a bear out in the middle of nowhere. And he's like, what happens if I can't do this? I mean, we've all been there. I've been there. I mean, we've all carried things. We've all had to face things that we didn't want to face. You know, being a little bit vulnerable, I know I was vulnerable about a roller coaster, but I'm gonna be a little bit more vulnerable today if that's okay with everybody. Most people wouldn't know this about me. I've got a big smile on my face all the time. I got a lot of lines. All these lines right here, lines, all that stuff, it's because I'm always like this. Hey, I like to have fun. I like to be around people. I like to have a good time. But most people wouldn't know this about me. Sometimes I struggle with depression. Sometimes it's hard for me to get up. Sometimes I let the circumstances of the world around me or the circumstances of of my life prevent me from realizing that God overcomes everything. It robs me of my joy. You know what, though? I can tell you something. Even though I experienced that and that comes from time to time. I mean, it's nothing extreme. It's not nothing too crazy. I've overcome it. I've overcome it. You know, something that was so cool here just a few months ago, we launched uh, Crossroads Recovery at our St. Pete campus, right? We did a relaunch. That's right. Give it up for Crossroads Recovery. Like, if you're not a part of Crossroads Recovery, why not? I am. 
Didn't think I needed to, but I am. You know why? Because it frees you from hurts, habits, and hang-ups. I was able to give depression over to God. I don't need to worry about it. And that took some boldness on my part. You know, sometimes, like, sometimes in my life, it's been a giant standing out in the middle of the field yelling at me. But you know what? Like, a courageous heart overcomes fear. And so I chose to believe that in my life. You want to see fear being overcome in people's lives? Come on a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday to Crossroads Recovery and listen to somebody speak about what God is doing in their life. I'm telling you what, it'll change yours. You see, that's what you realize, right? What you realize is no matter what your circumstance is or what's happening in your life, like it doesn't have to control you. And we see this play out. We see this play out in David's life because it goes on to say, as Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him, reaching into a shepherd's bag and taking out his stone. He hurled it with one sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. And the stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. You see, what you realize right here in this passage is you realize, right, like when you're challenged to make things right in your life, when you're challenged to make things right in your life and you have this holy confidence that goes before you, right, that says, I will overcome whatever fear that I have, you realize that that's where character is forged. In the heart of a champion has character. It's a courageous heart that leads the way for others. You know, and I do, I've seen that a lot in my life. I, you can, you can see that on a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday night. Somebody in a circle shares something and other people in the circle say, if God can do that in your life, he could do it in mine. A courageous life leads the way for others. Think about the people who you love and respect the most. They're oftentimes the people who have been most authentic and humble. It's exactly what Pastor Tim talked about last week. David humbled himself. We have to humble ourselves and realize, you know what? I can't do it, but I'm going to fight for what's right, and God's going to do it for me. See, when you do that, it doesn't just change your life. It changes the life of others. Because you're no longer robbed of your joy. You have joy that Scripture says is unspeakable. And it's filled with glory. And people see that and they're drawn to it and they can't help but ask why and how did this happen? And the beautiful part is what seemed like might be your destruction or your demise has turned into your triumph and your testimony. And you sharing what God has done in your life changes the life of other people. You see, the question that I have for you this morning is this. Where do you need to have courage in your life today? Where do you need courage in your life today? What is ruling? What is controlling? What is running your game? Because you don't have to let it. It could be your triumph. It could be your testimony. You see, it could be something at your job. Maybe it's the way you interact with people. You just don't like maybe how people are treating somebody or maybe something's going on. You're like, I don't know this. I don't know if I buy this. I don't know if this is really kosher. Maybe you do. You need to ask for that raise. You worry about it. You're worrying about work all the time, even when you're at home. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe you just, you've had a broken relationship for so long and it's okay. It's kind of on uncertain ground, but you don't want to push it because you're scared that it could be just destroyed forever. Maybe you carry a secret sin in your life that no one knows about. Maybe it's just you've, you've tried to hide it, you've managed, you've controlled it enough to where you think you've hidden it from people, but you know that like, you know that it rules your life. I mean, maybe you carry a burden with you, maybe it's anxiety, maybe it's just outright fear about everything, maybe it's depression, maybe it's you feel like you're inadequate for other people and you always got to please them and nothing's ever going to be good enough. Whatever it is, I promise you this today, that you can overcome that fear in your life. You don't have to let it rule you. It could be your triumph. It could point others to you. Where do you need courage in your life today? Because I think if you identify that and you give that over to God, just give it over to him. 
He wants to take it. I mean, because we all love that story, right? We all love the underdog, the boy who's fighting the giant. That can be your story. Where do you need courage in your life today? Because I promise you this, it will change your life when you give it over to him. And not only will it change your life, but it will change the life of those around you. What fears, ask yourself this question, what fears are keeping me from leading the way for others? If you would stand with me, no matter where you are today, and we're going to say a prayer together here in a moment. It's a yes to Jesus prayer. We do it every week. And why do we do it every week? Because we believe, no matter what we're speaking about, that we could say yes to Jesus. Today, we're saying yes to Jesus to give over the fear, the worry, the anxiety in our life to the one who overcomes it, the creator of all, univ- of all the universe, the giver of life. And the questions I want you to ask is, where do you need courage in your life today? And what fears are keeping you from leading the way for others? If you would, just read this prayer with me. And as we read it, I want you to symbol, I want you to realize and symbolically give your fear over to God. Jesus, I need you. I believe you are the savior of the world, that you gave your life to forgive my sins, and that God raised you from the grave so that I could have eternal life. Thank you for loving me. I'm saying yes to you, Jesus. Come into my life. I will follow you. Amen. Father, I pray that in this moment, whatever is in people's hearts, whatever is on their mind, God, whatever has maybe taken up too much space and has has affected their decisions and controlled the, the choices that they make because they're worried, they have fear, they have doubts, they have insecurities, whatever it is, if it's in their jobs, if it's in their homes, if it's them personally, just in the life that they have, Father, I ask that they would just release that to you today and that they would be free, that it would be a triumph in their life, not a a mark where they feel like they're less than, but that it would be a moment where they see a God who gives life, breathe life into what seemed maybe like a lost cause for them. Father, help us strike down the giants in our lives, not through our works, but through your power. Lord, we can't do this without you. We need you with us today. Father, I pray that each and every person here would know that they do not go alone. They're not in some open field by themselves, but that you are with them. You go before them, you are beside them, you are with them, it says, until the very end of the age. We thank you for everything that you've done for us in doing. We pray this in your powerful name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, today is a great day because you know what? We celebrate changed lives at Crossroads and there are people who said yes to Jesus today. And so if you said, let's, you know what? First of all, let's give a round of applause for people who said yes to Jesus today. People who gave something up to God. If you said yes to Jesus today, we would love to connect with you. Pastor Keith is right down here. We would love for you to head right over there right now. We have a gift. If you don't have a Bible, we want to make sure that you're equipped, right? David had a sling. We want to make sure you have our weapon of choice, which is God's word. And so Keith is right over here. We'd love to connect with you. We're so glad you're here today. We're celebrating changed lives, guys. Let's sing this next song together.